All right, guys, grab a seat if you haven't got one already. Welcome to our first quarterly Duo Tech Talk on the West Coast. Uh, we normally hold this in Ann Arbor. Um, I'm John Oberhide, co-founder and CTO of Duo Security. Um, we started Duo Tech Talks to bring out a, a technical community in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where most of our, our company is based. Um, but we wanted to bring our best friends and great speakers out to the West Coast as well. Um, so we, we do a board meeting out here once a quarter, so we'll just line up some, some good events. Um, Ryan's here today from Slack, and I've already voluntold uh, Diogo from Docker um, to present next quarter, I think in July time frame, not totally sure, um, but we'll put it on the meetup and um, get it out there early. Um, yeah, so uh, do a tech talk, just an opportunity to bring in some of our, our buddies who are doing really smart security stuff at a variety of companies and try to share that knowledge with you guys. Also me. Also, also Ryan, yeah. Doing okay stuff at okay companies. I mean, Slacks, it's okay. It's all right. I'm a big IRC fan. I mean, no emojis, but, you know, Aussie parrot. Um, so at, at Tech Talks, we often open it up for uh, any community announcements. If you guys have anything that's going on that's cool, um, raise your hand and we'll throw a microphone at you. We don't have our magic catch box microphone, but um, anything going on in the local community that we should know about? Hey guys, I'm Sam. I work at Bug Crowd. Uh, we have a number of people here from Bug Crowd. Um, we just made some news last week with our Series B fundraising, which is cool. But a part of that is that we're hiring. So um, we're hiring in uh, sales and marketing and operations, which includes a lot of security people. Um, so if you're interested in that sort of stuff, you can find me. I, I roll deep with three others in the security crew. So. Um, just flag us down. We're at bugcrowd.com. Yep, you got it. <laughs> Any other announcements? Job, job announcements are totally fine. Nobody else is hiring. Cool. Only bug crowd. Are uh, you hiring? Yes. Jobs.duoscurity.com. Across the board. We actually, uh, so we're based in primarily Ann Arbor, but we also have a, a San Mateo office and uh, just opened up an Austin office as well. So. Uh, again, sales, marketing, engineering, product, security. Uh, I feel like the security crowd here is probably a little stronger than the sales crowd. Um, but come talk to me if you guys are looking for cool gigs at a, a pretty cool company. Um, anything else? You guys go to BASEC at all? Does anybody go to BASEC? Give a, give a BASEC pitch. Well, it's kind of like an informal hangout at the Patriots in, uh, what is it, the second Embarcadero, I think? No, I, <laughs> I think that's the address or something. Yeah. So if you guys remember uh, uh, Montesano before they were acquired and before they were breached, um, I mean, uh, Tom Toshek started a, a movement called CitySec, which was a bunch of uh, meetups around the country. There was like, you know, SillySec, there's BaySec, there's ARPSec, there's BeanSec, all across the country. Um, BaySec meets up here in the city. Uh, Nate Lawson from Root Labs, uh, Source DNA, I think still runs it-ish. And SillySec still meets somewhere, somewhere silly? Where? First, which Wednesday? OK. Cool. So go check out Jason, right? Go talk to Jason if you want to hang out with cool security people and. Uh, drink beer and talk about security. Um, okay, with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Ryan Huber, a uh, good buddy and a security guy at uh, Slack. Congratulations on the, the recent fundraising, uh, really exciting. Um, Ryan's gonna talk today about automating security and uh, how you build a security program that, that scales as an organization like Slack is so rapidly scaling. So give him a warm welcome. Thank you. All right, so I'm doing, I'm doing two hands today. I've got a microphone and this presenter, so anything could happen. Um, so, standard, oh, we have our first tech fail. Wait, 
now I click this button. Yes. Does, does your Chromebook not support USB? I, I can't believe the person that introduced me to Chromebooks would make fun of my Chromebook. <laughs> it doesn't seem right. OK, so about me, uh, blah, 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 no one cares. Um, but I work at Slack. Uh, how many people in the room don't know what Slack is? Raise your hand. OK, good. That saves us time. Um, so at the, end of this, uh, at the end of this talk, there's some additional information. It's actually in the form of a GitHub gist. So uh, if anyone was planning on furiously taking notes during this thing, don't bother. Everything's in that gist. Or is it pronounced gist? I don't know. I think so. GIF. GIF. Um, how, many, uh, how many of the folks out here today are security folks? OK, lots of people. Um, cool. So did, any, did anyone uh, happen to see the blog post I wrote about, uh, about security at Slack? Like, quick show of hands. OK, a few people. Good. Um, this is basically just a repeat of that, so you can leave. I'm, I'm, it's not. Uh, it's, it's longer than a blog post. So I want, I want to start off and talk a little bit about breaches. And uh, um, I think one of the important points here is how does a company know when it's been hacked, right? So. I think the best case here is the company's employees notice something strange, right? This means that people inside the company saw something odd and were like, yep, that's a problem. Let's figure out what happened. Second best, not quite as good, is a third party contacts that company because they notice something strange. Uh, this sucks because it's often Brian Krebs. How many people know Brian Krebs? Yeah, lots of people. Uh, if, uh, <laughs> I actually ran into Brian Krebs once in, uh, in Las Vegas. And uh, my, the first time I met him, I said, um, I love your blog, but I hope I never hear from you. And, and uh, he, uh, he was actually a really, really nice person. So I enjoyed chatting with him. But I really hope to never get a call from Brian Krebs. It's terrifying. So next up is hackers contact the company because they want the company to notice something strange. This is pretty bad. Uh, they, They've basically done whatever they want to do at this point. Now they're just showing off. And uh, you're probably not in a great, great position there. And then actually the worst case is they don't, right? They don't notice something's wrong. And this is like, um, oh, let's call it APT. You know, this, this is like the, uh, the breach is ongoing. They have no idea. And they're, they're really not going to find out. So what's the important factor here? Uh, in my opinion, it's, it's time, right? So you know. If given enough time, somebody else is going to notice your breach. And given enough time, you're never going to notice your breach. So you know, I think time plays the biggest part in, in this, whole, uh, this whole thing. So how do, how do people get in? Right? It's, uh, it's all super hackers, isn't it? Like, how many of you, when you think of, uh, when you think of people breaking into systems, picture like a person uh, with a ski mask at a laptop? You know the one I'm talking about. Uh, and, and, you know, they're just dropping O'Day left and right, and that's how they got in. Uh, does anyone think that's how most companies are breached? It is a confirmed fact. Yes, that is how most companies are breached. Um, how many people know what the DBIR is? I, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands a lot. I'm sorry. Uh, so, so this is the 2015 DBIR, and a uh, couple of choice quotes from this. But the gist of it, you know, I'm, I'm not going to read them out. The gist of it is that credential theft is still, by and large, what happens, right? So putting credentials in silly places like GitHub, um, all, kinds of, all kinds of things happen with credentials. Update, this, uh, this just came out. So the new DBR just came out, I think, Tuesday, Monday? I don't know. I don't know when it dropped. But uh, good news, it shows we haven't learned how to improve security. So we're all doing a terrible job. Everyone that raised your hand is a security industry person. Uh, should feel a little sad right now. And uh, it's, you know, whatever, these headlines, who cares? But the one that kind of stood out to me isn't, isn't the headline. It's actually the subtext on this one. Um, who cares about the top bit? But Verizon annual report finds breaches happening faster and taking longer to be detected. So what did I just talk about? I just said, like, time to detect is a major thing. And according to the DBIR, it's actually taking longer for companies to notice this. So in some way, we're probably actually getting worse, uh, which, which sucks. That, that, by the way, that vector graphic looks amazing uh, on everything I've, I've displayed it on. So how many, how many people here saw the uh, talk from Enigma this year where the, the Tau chief 
uh, from NSA talked about, sorry? Rob Joyce from the NSA spoke about how they actually break into networks. How many people saw that? Okay, only a few. Go watch that talk. Like, it's 20 minutes of your life, and it is one of the best talks uh, on the subject. And the gist of it is, spoiler, the gist of it is that uh, they, don't, they don't break in with, with O'Day. They don't burn O'Day on your company. What they do is they learn about your network, and then they figure out what you haven't thought of or what you're not paying attention to, and then they go in that way. Like, it, it's really simple. And I think, the, I think the quote was something like, we understand your network better than you do, right? So not a great position to be in, uh, but, but the point here is that like, this is also what you're facing with most, ad most adversaries. They have a lot of time on their hands and they're just gonna keep poking at things. So go watch that talk. Uh, I can never remember why I have this slide in here. I just guess it looks cool. Next. Um, so, so what I'm gonna talk about today is actually just one example of automating security at Slack, but it's kind of my favorite right now. So here, here are the sections, collecting data, detection rules, alerts, verification, and then we'll do a little Q&A at the end. But before that, uh, we gotta start somewhere. And uh, let's start small. So I joined Slack something like 19 months ago. Uh, I was employee 50 whatever, uh, the, the very first security employee. And uh, speaking of starting slow, like one of the things I like about things like uh, say game development or you know, uh, things that, it, that involve constrained environments, like if you ever hacked on a TI-85, like that kind of stuff, is that it forces you to think a little bit differently, a little bit outside the box and when you understand those constraints. And I think that's kind of an advantage in some ways. So when I was looking at being the only security person at Slack at the time, I was like, okay, uh, this is going to be really difficult, so I need to, to think of ways to make myself more effective. And really, my goal was to, to watch a lot of things. So we have a lot of people uh, you know, doing stuff day in and day out. But I, but I don't want it to be a dashboard. Okay, I lied a little bit. We have a dashboard. So this is an example of one of the things I'll show you later. And uh, by the way, Nate, who's also, this is me, R. Huber, and Nate is right there in the corner. Everyone please turn and look at Nate so he's very embarrassed. Uh, Nate actually just killed my video feed, which isn't very nice. <laughs> Hold on one sec. Chromebooks, right? Okay. So, so my real goal, and by the way, this takes me back to like way early in my career. So I started at this sometime in 99 or 2000. I worked at a company called Orbits.com. And we had this tool called NetCool, which is not cool. It is the worst tool I've ever dealt with. And basically what this, what this tool is for, it's not a security tool, it's for monitoring infrastructure. And you'd set up all kinds of alerts, and then you'd burn through this thing, right? So um, it was, a, it, it was a, a task that just had no end in sight. And, oh. Yep. Here's the thing I'm gonna try. This, this could go terribly wrong. Oop. Goodbye, cruel internet. Okay. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <sighs> this is actually, it's changing resolution. You like the planes? All right. And present. Okay, so I'm gonna just skip that whole bit. But anyway, NetCool's ghost hates me, and so don't use NetCool. Uh, so let's do a bit of uh, behind the scenes at Slack. And so this is stuff that nobody has seen before, um, so get very excited. Uh, so I don't know if you know, but we have a pretty amazing new data center that we just set up. Uh, this, is actually, this is actually our new facility. And uh, as you can see, actually Slack is just the left side right now, but we're gonna expand into the right. I'm obviously kidding. We're, this is our data center. Uh, it is a cloud. And this is actually our other cloud uh, that we call SecOps. And I know DevOps, SecOps, terrible terms, whatever, but that's what we call it. So starting small, one of the things we, uh, we wanted was our own AWS account. And why do we want that? Because 
we have a team of people who know how to do development stuff, uh, on the security team that is, who know how to do decent development and also have really good security hygiene. Um, and so the reason we actually asked for our own AWS account was, besides like mining Bitcoin, was that we could control access to that much easier than we could control access to something like prod. So if we put all of our security tools in prod, then we're protecting the thing, you know, we're, we're uh, running alongside the thing we're protecting, right? And so it actually eliminates a lot of problems to do this. And, and the thing to know about this, uh, this second account, I'm just gonna keep fighting this thing. It's gonna resize again, wait for it. And the thing about this, uh, this account is that it is actually a separate account. So it doesn't share anything. It's not a different VPC, it's not whatever. It is actually an entirely separate AWS account. If you can get your CTO to agree to this, do it, it's amazing. You can do whatever you want in there. And it's like this big on the budget. So um, own AWS account is great. And then we also have our own ops. So uh, Nate and I are, are the majority of the SecOps team, but we have experience using operational tools, right? So. Well, Nate has experience run using operational tools, and then I've learned a lot from Nate. All right, so we, we, have this, uh, we have this fun environment. What do we do with it? The first thing was set up a reliable logging pipeline. So we have all of these servers, and it's something like 3,000, 4,000, uh, thousands of servers. And they're all running in AWS. And we want to get logs from all of them. And so... The place we started with this was not to come up with our own magical, by the way, don't roll your own uh, log collection either. Like, just like crypto, just use something that works. Uh, so we use, we use our syslog with RELP, which stands for reliable ELP. <laughs> no idea, but the, the, the reliable is the important bit. All right, so what do we do with that data? So we take all, so we have all of these hosts and then we send all of that data directly to something called StreamStash. Now, that's actually crossing the boundary into the SecOps environment. So every host in production actually sends its logs straight into this other AWS environment. They don't, they don't stop anywhere. They just go straight out of the host into StreamStash. You can also use LogStash or don't do that. And I'll just leave it there. Uh, so this is a, this is a graph. Just kidding. Uh, this is a graph, and so this is like just looking at what it, you know, like here, here's kind of an interesting one that doesn't work. Uh, RELP connections. So you can see at the, at the time I took this screenshot, which was probably a couple of months ago, there were 2,700 RELP connections. And it's, you know, it's a decent amount of data, but uh, it's manageable with just a couple of instances of StreamStash. And again, this, is, this isn't uh, trivial to set up, but it's, it's pretty easy. So we store everything in Elasticsearch. Uh, how many people use Elasticsearch? Cool. Do you, how many people use Elasticsearch for security stuff? Wow, awesome. Okay, us too. Uh, so let's talk about the data sources and, and what, we, what we do to get this data into Elasticsearch. Okay, so we're, we're on to my favorite subject. John is shaking his head. Um, everyone settle in, there's three hours of this. So, so Audit D is one of my favorite things. And uh, how many people here use Audit D? Two. Uh, so, okay, so Audit D. So, uh, for those of you that don't know, Audit D is a subsystem that's been in the Linux kernel since I don't know when. It's, uh, it's been around for a long time. And what it, what it can let you do is actually monitor uh, syscalls, right? So, you can just say, Audit D, I want to know every exec VE, or I want to know every file opener, whatever. And it can do that. And that's great. And you already have it, much like you have SE Linux and AppArmor and all that other stuff you've turned off. It's right there, um, which, is, which is fantastic. And here's how you configure it. This is where it gets a bit dark. Okay, so this is actually pretty okay. Uh, let's watch all 64-bit. Can everyone sort of see that? Okay. Uh, this is where, so I want to see every 64-bit exec VE, and then I want to see every 32-bit exec VE. That's great. Now. I'm actually logging through Audit D every, every new process spawned on a box, effectively. And the bottom rule here is uh, let me know when this file is being accessed. So th this, is a, this is not a useful example, but this is just proc CPU info. And WAR is write, append, read, maybe, I don't know. But, uh, and then dash K is actually add this key to it so that when I, when I get it back out of Audit D, I know that it's keying on that, on that rule. Here's where it's not as fun. 
Okay. <laughs> so, and I, I hope the person that worked on Audit D originally doesn't ever hear me talk about this, but uh, the log format is not my favorite. And, okay, so we're going to look at this for a minute. Actually, I'm going to make it a little bit better. So this is out of D message. So let's just look at it. Let's trim off that whole time code audit D thing. And this is what we're actually dealing with. We're, we're getting a little better. All right. Slack sticker for the person who can tell me how many audit D events that represents. Three. Who said it? Okay, and by the way, I gave these really great separators there, uh, but it's, that's, that's three events. So three things happened there. Uh, in the first one, what did I do? I catted proc CPU info. In the second one, I ran the uptime command, and sorry, that's a file watch on catting proc CPU info, and then the bottom one is the actual exec VE of that. Uh, the, this is all to say that, oh, how can you tell which ones are related? So if I hadn't put these spaces between the lines, what part of that tells you that these events, in this multi-line, it's a multi-line format, what tells you they're related? Another Slack sticker. Yeah, so the timestamp is probably going to get you there. But if you look really closely, it's actually, that's the identifier. So, um, so we have the timestamp. And you can actually just take this as one, one thing, generally. But the timestamp is, as you can see, the second item inside the parens after the colon, uh, which is not a lot of fun for parsing. And this is what set me down the path of uh, maybe changing what the logs look like when they come out of here. So Audit D has this facility, or this, uh, this capability called Audisp. And you can write Audisp plugins. All they are are plugins that accept from, uh, they, sorry, they, they're standard in, will receive every Audit D event in that format I just showed you. So you can write an Audisp plugin, and then the Audit D process on a box will spawn that as a child, and then just send all of the logs through it. And so that's, that's pretty good. You can do a lot of stuff with that. But in investigating that, uh, we found that really the logs coming out of the kernel also just, just look like this. So that, that Audit D, that daemon that's running, doesn't actually do anything except maybe write the file and send it to other places. That's not, that's not super interesting to us. So instead, what we did was actually wrote, wrote our own uh, replacement for Audit D called Go Audit. Slack sticker, who can guess what language it's written in? Yes, you all get, uh, by the way, I have a ton of these, so everyone gets one. Uh, so it's written in Go. And, uh, and this is where Nate comes into, into play here, because I, I wrote the original version of Go Audit, and then Nate does these things called documentation and testing. And I'm, I'm still learning how some of that works, but Nate does an excellent job of it. So a, a bit to know about Go Audit, what it does is it actually takes these lines and, uh, and turns them into one JSON blob, right? So instead of like that, that multi-line format, you now have JSON. And then, like I said, we use Elasticsearch, so we're just taking this JSON, sending it through Streamstash, not really modifying it at all. And, uh, and Go Audit is something we, I promise we will open source this year. Like, not Diogo promise, like really promise. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> too soon. Um, no, I, I promise we'll actually open source Go Audit this year. Uh, I, I think it's a really useful tool, and we're getting there with the documentation. But the point is, we don't want to just throw it over the fence and say, here's this thing we wrote, good luck. Uh, we actually want to have decent, decent uh, docs and, and show people how to use it. So this is a quick example of what it looks like. This is me hopping on. I actually changed PS1 because uh, I didn't want you to see what host I was on because um, I was being very paranoid. So I logged into one of our hosts and I ran the, the super nefarious uptime command. And this is just to show you that like I ran it, bam, there it is. I actually ran it multiple times, uh, but there it is showing up in Kibana. And so the log pipeline is that uh, from, from Audit D through RELP to Streamstash, and then into Kibana. And so Streamstash, like Logstash, just puts it straight into Elasticsearch. Some other stuff you should collect are your auth logs. How many, by the way, how many people use Paper Trail? Is that a thing? OK. So Paper Trail is kind of cool. Like, if you don't have great capabilities around collecting your logs, you should probably just use something like this, where you can send them a stream of your logs. It's, it's pretty handy. CloudTrail, if you're in AWS. I, I'll stop asking questions, but I'm sure some of you are. CloudTrail is really good for, for this as well. Uh, you can get sort of every action from your AWS account. 
OS Query, anyone else use an OS Query? I know you are. Can I say that? Yeah. Um, so some, some folks using OS Query, pretty, pretty cool tool out of uh, Facebook. And uh, we're, we're not using it on prod instances, but we're using it on things like endpoints. And it's, it's really good. And then, of course, web logs. So just lots of logs. So I want to talk briefly about the Defender's Advantage. And the best example of this I've heard, uh, so I don't know if you, you've heard any of uh, Haroon Mir's talks, but I could watch those on repeat. He's a really, really smart person. And he gave, uh, he gave a really good talk last year at Black Hat about sort of the asymmetry of attack versus defense. And one of my favorite things about that was he, he sort of talked about how if the attacker doesn't know what to avoid, then you actually have a bit of an advantage there, right? If they don't know what tripwires you have in place, then that's an advantage that you should, you should uh, you know, know of and, and keep. And, and one other thing, like zero days are not invisibility cloaks. So they, they may be invisibility cloaks given an isolated uh, machine, right? Like on a laptop, maybe you hop in, but really they're not invisibility cloaks. They, they are fantastic. You can do a lot with a zero day, but you can't just evade everything magically. So don't treat them like that. So when thinking about rules and how to, uh, how to look for malicious activity, my favorite case is the hypothetical malicious insider. And the reason for that is if somebody knows your network intimately and has access to it, that's the hardest thing to defend against, other than, other than disgruntled security employee. But like beyond that, be, like hypothetical malicious insider will cover a lot of cases. And also, if somebody does break in, they're going to do a lot of the same things, and they're going to be noisier about it. So if you cover this case, you're actually kind of covering a lot of things. I'm not a huge fan of off-the-shelf rule sets. So this is why like, you know, everyone makes fun of antivirus and, and whatever these days. And it's because you can, you can upload your malware sample and test it against every antivirus, and when it passes all of them, it works. And then you just send it into the wild. It's fantastic. Oh, we made it, we made it a while that time. Do we have music for right now? OK. Oh, no, that was the best one. OK, so off-the-shelf rule sets, not a fan. You can, you can do this. You can buy a SIM, and you can like, have your rules there, and somebody else can make them for you. But this is, this is where you should probably actually invest your time. This is what you should maybe be doing as a security team, is creating these rules and figuring out what bad activity looks like. I mean, everyone's already seen it. This is just mission control, and I thought it looked cool. And I also don't remember why this one's in there. Oh, and I spotted today that like, it's actually shuttle control, because on the bottom left there, you can see the space shuttle. And for some reason, there's a version of it going forward, and then one pointed straight down at Earth, uh, which also broke my display. What's that? You think it's this? All right. So where do you store all this stuff? So how many people use Splunk? Yes, those are the rich people in the room. Congratulations. Uh, what's that? <laughs> well put. Should I try turning it off and on again? OK. All right, so Splunk is pretty cool. We use Elasticsearch. And how many people use Elastalert? OK, so Elastalert is a Yelp project. It's something that you should definitely check out. It's just stored queries against Elasticsearch. So it's something that allows you to say, uh, like you can, if you use Kibana, you can take the, the search you did in Kibana, and you can just plug it into an Elastalert rule, and then you can do that query every second if you'd like. And it's really handy for, you know, I've identified this thing that looks suspicious, so I'm just going to do it every second. So let's talk a little bit, bit about rules. What, what, what should your rules cover? Well, commands are a decent example, right? If we have all this data from AuditD from every host in prod, we should look at what commands people run, like uptime. 
We should also look at what files they're accessing. So presumably your instances will have some sort of credential data or something sensitive on them. I'm just going to, like, these are mostly one word slides, so I'm just going to keep talking. Uh, so, oh, actually, I have an idea. I was actually going to try mirroring. Okay, just stand over here now. So files, uh, files are a good thing to watch. So if somebody, so it's presumably you have files that are interesting on the box. You can also watch uh, maybe files regarding commands that you don't normally use. You can do all kinds of stuff with files. More audit rules here. Sockets, so again, I said with, uh, with audit D, you can actually look at every syscall. A lot of stuff related to sockets there that's, that's pretty interesting. So this is slightly different from what I've been talking about so far, but you can also start looking at things like when are these commands being run and how do they relate to that user. So if I know that someone cannot be awake for 24 hours a day, that... Oh. All right, I'm going to try one more thing. Let's see. Extending and here. Okay. Now I can't hide what's on my screen anymore. But when it fails, it's going to fail back. We hope. Okay. Yes. Cool. All right. So GOIP. Uh, so time awake's big. GOIP is. Uh, we all know the cases of like somebody logs in from X country and then somebody and then they log in from another country and that doesn't make any sense. This can be useful. But one thing I really like to look at is just IP. So this was a fun one. Uh, I looked at, I, I actually recorded and looked at how many different IPs I connected to Slack, or connected to Slack from over the course of an entire year. Uh, I'm giving away these Slack stickers like crazy. Who can guess how many times, and by the way, I travel a fair amount, like whatever, so take that into account. Um, how many different IPs, and just guess a range of 50, did I use in a year? Just throw out an answer. Throw out a seven, 500, not even close. Getting closer. Lo, no, way below that. So, okay, so it's uh, 90. <laughs> uh, that was kind of a, a, a weird revelation to me because I was like, you know what? I travel a lot. Why don't I use more IPs? And I was like, well, because I often just hotspot my phone. I'm on mega carrier NATs. Like, it's actually really predictable what IPs you come from. And that's useful information, especially if you think about that across. Uh, all of your employees, right? So if each employee, uh, if you know which IPs they're coming from, you can all, it's not quite a whitelist, but you can kind of guess uh, whether something is malicious based on that, and that can be useful. So let's talk about alerting. So we wrote this thing called Alert Center, and this is sort of the source of truth for everything. And what Alert Center, it, it's basically just receiving JSON blobs. When we decide something is bad in ElastAlert, we actually just send it into Alert Center, and this manages the life cycle. And then we have something called Security Bot that connects to Alert Center and says, what are the things I haven't talked to someone about? Let me know, and I will send them an alert. And here it comes. Oh, and now it went into extending mode? All right. I'm going to smash my laptop. Yeah, I guess it Security bot. If anyone saw the blog post, they know that security bot is the thing that nags all of the people at Slack constantly and says, why did you run this command on a box? It also does nagging for other things. 
And this is what it looks like. I, you probably can't see that very well. But it says, in this example, this is straight out of the blog post. It says, I see you just r ran the command flurb-export on accounting server 01. By the way, we don't have accounting server 01. People ask me this. Like, it's not a real box. I made this up. And it says, this is a sensitive command, so please acknowledge this activity by typing acknowledge. I type acknowledge, and what happens? This is where the whole plug for Duo happens. Um, so get excited. So what happens is, I say acknowledge, the bot actually connects out independently and sends a duo push. And then from my phone I say, yep, that was me, and then the alert is cleared from Alert Center. Here's an important lesson. <laughs> Don't overwhelm everyone with these alerts. So we have, a, we have a really good ops team, and they can run commands on a lot of servers really fast. And if they happen to trip one of your alarms, don't send them 3,000 alerts because, for one thing, it makes it really hard for them to do anything else in Slack when their client is just receiving alerts nonstop. And for another thing, we want to keep them our friends. So let's talk about verification. And, and this is an important bit. Uh, there's a fun anecdote about Carbon Black. OK, oh, yes, how many people use Carbon Black? OK, just us. Uh, so Carbon Black is, is, is pretty awesome, but I was talking to a, a friend of mine that runs a security team, and we were talking about his first red team exercise. And I was like, so how did that go? He said, yeah, I mean, they, they really just moved in quickly, did whatever they wanted. And I was like, so what did you have on your endpoints? Like, what, you know, what, what were you using to protect it? And by the way, this isn't a dig on Carbon Black. He said, yeah, I had Carbon Black everywhere. How did they get past that? He's like, oh, yeah, they turned it off. <laughs> so, um, so verification is important. And one of the ways you can do that are canaries. So having rules that you expect to run regularly and maybe are slightly unpredictable can help you actually validate that your boxes are actually sending alerts, right? If somebody can just disable your alerting and do whatever they want, is it very useful as security alerting? Probably not. Red team exercises are also really good because based on what I, I heard there, you know, you learn a lot. And we, uh, we're getting to the point of like, let's do some tabletop red teams. If you're not doing at least tabletop red teams, you should probably start that process. They, uh, they give you a lot of insight and they at least get the stakeholders in the same place. Bonus, what if they got in anyway? So that sucks, but say somebody got in. Well, your forensic data is there and if you've actually split, split off your security environment from everything else, then there's a solid chance that that forensic data is actually useful and hasn't been tampered with. You can also rent some computers temporarily, which is really neat. In AWS, you can do something like spin up instances with all of your log data ever and then search it. That's really powerful. That's something that, you know, a few years ago you couldn't even fathom. Now you can just take all of that data back out of wherever you've stored it launch Elasticsearch instances and have them online in a couple of hours and, and look at every log you've ever created. I was kidding, it's not three hours, we're at the summary. One big thing here was we, we've built a lot of this as we go and we, you know, we run into, run into little issues with it, but don't let perfection be the enemy of good in this especially. Again, the advantage for, for defense is sometimes that, that attackers don't know exactly what you're looking for and so just looking for some things is already doing better than you were when you weren't looking at those logs at all. And I guess if I had one sort of, you know, mantra, it's log everything and look at your logs. And agreed, there are advanced, there are, there are, there are really good attacks that aren't going to be in your logs, but there are a lot of attacks that are going to be in your logs. So log everything you possibly can and then think about how to process that data. That's the most important thing you can probably be doing in your environment. And with that, and by the way, thank you whoever said that I should not maximize the screen. You are a hero. Uh, so with that, this is the uh, link to the GitHub gist of all that stuff. And anyone that, uh, that <laughs> <laughs> one last dig, nobody gets to see the GitHub link. I'm getting pretty okay at dragging stuff back over, though. All right, so there it is. Uh, and by the way, anyone here or 
that happens to watch this stream or the blooper reel that is this talk uh, can, can reach out to me. And if you want to take a look at Go Audit, we're adding people to the sort of private repo and, and having people test it. And we'd love to have other people help us out with that and, and take a look at it. So please do reach out, anyone here, anyone wherever, and, uh, and we'll add you to that project on GitHub. And then, like I said, sometime later this year, we'll actually open source that. So with all of that, does anyone have questions? You guys have a bug bounty, right? <laughs> Dangerous question. Maybe. <coughs> okay. How do you, regardless, how do you, um, that kind of stuff's going to trigger a lot of alarms. How do you deal with that? The bug bounty stuff is going to trigger a lot of alarms? Well, it, pen tests, bug bounties, you, you, that stuff's going to trigger a lot of alarms. So we, we treat all of the alarms as, you know, if they're, if they're being too noisy, then we try to scale that back a bit. Yep. But we, you know, we, uh, as far as, as far as alarms that have been triggered by bug bounties, not really. I mean, there, right. haven't, there haven't really been any uh, bug bounty related intrusions that were like, stole all the S3 keys and then oh, read so everything. This is like <laughs> system stuff, so you're not, I guess, watching web requests as well. No, I mean, we're looking at, we're looking at cloud trail logs. Yeah, we're looking no at a lot of stuff. Anything. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. And, and again, this fits into the don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Like, we add stuff to look at all the time. Yep. What do you guys do about, uh, so you send this Slack message, and there needs to be some response in terms of acknowledgement. You know, how, how quickly and how often do you actually get a response, and what do you do if someone went out for lunch? And what's the timeout on that? So. The messages actually, I mean, everyone has Slack on their mobile device and whatever, and because we just do a push, you can actually act that event. The, the major thing we do with the alerts, though, and this is actually one of our goals, is to ensure that the time from, you know, the action, so whatever triggered the alarm, until the person receives the alert, we try to keep that under a minute, right? So that, that's really key here, because if you are sending an alert on something that happened two hours ago, people are just going to be like, I guess I did that. I, I don't know. I, yeah, I ran curl and downloaded the, the JVM and ran it. I don't know. So what we actually do is we actually we, we keep those as fast as we can. We keep that cycle as fast as we can as, as it can be. And we, ha we don't really run into those cases. I mean, somebody's usually at their keyboard when they get one of those alerts. So what's you? Oh, sorry. You've also got one. Uh, so just ballpark figure, what, what kind of ingest are you looking at at Elasticsearch for your events? Nate? Yeah, like, I think you're saying how many events are we getting? Yeah, how many events, how big, like how much? 20,000 a second-ish, depending on the rule set, yeah. Yeah. I mean, right now, I, I can give you some sizing on like the Elasticsearch cluster we have in SecOps right now. It's, I want to say it's got right now online, let's say two weeks of data, and that's a couple of terabytes. So it's, it's quite a bit of data. But um, as far as rate, I mean, I guess, yeah, 20 to 30,000 a second. The, see, the thing is like, also when, when it's peak time of the day, when operators are actually doing stuff, it goes up significantly, right? Because when, when just uh, Apache processes are spawning or whatever, there's not really that much going on. But when people are actually doing, doing things on individual servers, that rate just skyrockets. So you can actually see when our operators wake up every day in the, in the uh, graph. What's the magnitude of like, alerts that are actually sent and responded to? Like how many go ignore? How, how often do you annoy everybody? Uh, I mean empower, empower everybody. How, we empower everyone all the time. But we, we send alerts. I mean, really, the, the other nice thing about this model, by the way, is that if there are certain things that are borderline OK, but you prefer operators don't do, what this does is actually nudges them toward not doing those things anymore. So if somebody runs curl in a way that you don't like, but gets an alert every single time they do it, They'll, they'll do something else. Like, hopefully it's not just work around it, but they'll do something else, right? And that's, that's useful. Another, you know, a, a good example of that is, like, if, if people do something like, 
hypothetically laterally SSH. Or, by the way, uh, I'm going to go on a tangent for a second. Uh, don't use SSH agent ever. Like, or sorry, forwarding. Don't use SSH agent forwarding ever. Please, please don't do that. Um, thank you. Uh, I actually, I'm actually going to tell a quick story about that. So I went to give a security talk at a local company, and it was actually about forensics. It was about disk forensics. And I said, okay, so I've set up this instance in DigitalOcean, and this is a you know, try-at-home game. Everyone log into that instance, and we're going to start digging around and figuring out what happened here. And then I just went into temp and was like, all right, whose SSH agents are those? Right now, raise your hands. Nobody touch your keyboard. Um, and the reason for that, by the way, if, if you're not aware, is that uh, if you're root on a box and somebody forwards their agent, you're now them everywhere, and that's terrible. So don't, don't ever do that. Um, so yeah, we, we push people toward doing uh, things that are maybe a little bit cleaner, and then over time, you can actually start shutting things off that maybe were accepted practice within the company. I think that's another valuable outcome here. Can you talk a little bit about your prevention stuff? Uh, I mean, a lot of this stuff is around detection. Yeah, I, so, you know, I, I'm prevented from displaying things. Uh, so we, we do a lot of uh, standard stuff as far as endpoints and, and prevention. I mean, um, I, 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 to be honest, I don't want to go into detail on what we do there. I think, I think that, like, sharing security knowledge in this way is useful, but much in the same way I won't share with you what our rule sets are, I don't really like going into detail about what the individual protection mechanisms are, right? But I think, I think like generally setting up something like this is useful, and that's why I think it's worth talking about. So, stuff. I have a follow-up question on that, uh, but not about uh, prevention, but how do you hire security analysts that have, have the appetite to do forensics and research and whatnot? Um, I, it's a great question. I mean, it's, it's a really, uh, it, it always feels like a small industry. Like, you come to something like this and you're like, oh yeah, you, I, I know you. There, there are you know, very few people uh, in, the security, in the security world and you run across the same people all the time. Hiring people, I mean, who knows, you're competing with a lot of, uh, a lot of big players out there. So you know, I, I think you luck out sometimes when you find someone that's interested in something like operations. And my, one of my favorite things is to find operations people or developers who have an interest in security because they have so many good practices already and they fundamentally understand computers in a way that you can probably tack on some security knowledge and they can do really valuable work there. So we're not talking about like, you know, uh, writing exploits, but like I think building a team, you can leverage a lot of that knowledge that people already have in other, in other realms. So are we still on like a streaming thing? We are? Okay. So uh, I would just say, back to your point, I have a bunch of stuff to say, so I'm just going to hijack your biz. <laughs> you so, want to come up? Um, so with respect to the question about analytics, I would say, um, like, if you're not doing attack-driven defense, everyone should. Like, pop your business, act like an attacker. It's not that hard. It's fun. And it can inform your modeling. Uh, secondly, like, uh, poll time. Who logs laptops outside of OS Query or Carbon Black? Please raise your hands. Some of you are lying, and I know this. Do that. Like, do that a lot. It's really valuable. And beyond that, I would say, uh, to your point about carbon black, um, the red teams are not the only ones that know about that. And I've seen that. So you might too. Hopefully you don't. Um, it hasn't happened to my company, which I'm really grateful for, but I've seen it happen to others. Uh, so plan for it like model it, understand what it looks like, and then enumerate that in your analytics so you can detect it when it's disabled or subverted. Um, and beyond that, uh, in addition to that, OS Query is really popular now. Really popular, open Slack channel, which is great. More developers, but more visibility, so plan for that too. Yeah. And if you don't plan for that, it's gonna happen to you. Like Carbon Black was really obscure a couple of years ago, and now more advanced actors know about it, they know how to subvert it, whether it's uh, unloading Kex, disabling services on Windows, or just pointing your Carbon Black server to localhost, which is super easy. So yeah, and and one thing to keep in mind too, like I mentioned that zero days are not invisibility cloaks, but one of the one of the other big advantages you have is when you have thousands of of servers, you can look at things in aggregate, right? And that's 
a really powerful mechanism. And that's one of the things that OS Query allows you to do is what packages are installed on every machine in my environment and then what's this new one that I've never seen before. So, you know, these are really valuable tools and you should definitely take a look at OS Query. I think they've done a lot of good work there. I want to I say there was a thread on Daily Dave uh, a few years back, or I think, I think it was a, a back and forth between Dave and some folks at CrowdStrike that said, we've never seen an adversary disable our host-based software. And Dave's it's, response was, of course, of course you haven't seen it, because once you <laughs> disable it, it stops phoning home. <laughs> it's kind of inherent. Yeah, that, that is true. So I'll uh, throw a softball at you. Oh, yes. Generally, Slack, fast-growing company, you know, maybe a, a few dollars a month you're growing. Um, what's the hardest part about securing that kind of environment? It's, uh, you know, the, the growth brings a lot of challenges. I think one, one that we became aware of kind of early on in this process, so say around 150 employees, was that when Slack started, it was sort of a small group of developers that had been doing this for a long time and knew each other well and uh, sort of knew each other's style. When you start growing, you start bringing in new people that, that are outside of that style a bit, but also some more junior people, right? And one of the things I think that was, that was a, a lesson there was you can't have sometimes a junior person review code from another junior person, right? So it's kind of an assumption that like you have a small core team and that anyone can review anyone's code, but you have to start thinking about things like that uh, very differently as, as you grow. As far as security challenges for the company, it's really all the stuff around endpoint management. I mean, I, I can't say enough how important it is that you have some way to manage your laptop fleet or at least know what your fleet is. Um, device attestation is, is really difficult, but it's extremely valuable. And uh, John and I have, have spoken a lot about Beyond Corp style stuff. This is some other uh, required reading. If it's not in the gist, I'll put it in after the talk. But, you know, Google does a lot of really cool stuff here where they actually do attestation of individual devices and decide whether that device has access to sensitive stuff. So knowing your fleet and having good inventory is key there. And as you grow, you really need to keep that information uh, updated. I think that's, that's important. That's all Ryan and I do in our spare time is we send private messages to each other about Beyondcorp. Yes. It's a budding relationship. Yeah. I just sent one now. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, you want to you want to ask the off-stream question? Uh, can you stop the stream?